Welcome to the Merliand. I'm Dominic Machado, and today I am joined by Sri Lanka's number one cricket journalist, Estelle Vasudevan, and Sri Lanka's best cricket historian, Nick Brooks. We're going to be talking about the disaster in South Africa. I know we kind of did our therapy sessions last week with the live shows, and we're going to kind of dive into what does this Sri Lankan side need to do in order to win that second test match and keep themselves in the running for that world test championship final berth. Uh, Before we get into it, a couple housekeeping notes. One, if you're looking for a a mortgage, um, please contact Mike Ward. Um, He's got you covered in the UAE, Saudi Arabia, and the UK. Second, if you're listening, watching on whatever platform you're looking at this on, like, subscribe, comment. We really enjoy your comments. Your comments keep us uh, rolling, give us a lot of energy. Um, also, subscribe to the Merle End newsletter. We've been coming out with more pieces more regularly. We're going to have more stuff coming this week in advance of the test match as well. Okay, so let's get started uh, by kind of talking about that first test match. You know, Sri Lanka play that first day. They, they're, they're bowling first. They get South Africa 80 for four. There are a couple missed opportunities. They end up 191 all out. And then um, we have that disaster of a second innings from Sri Lanka where they go 42 all out, their all-time lowest test score. And then they are shut out of the game and they put on a decent batting performance in the fourth innings, but it's just not good enough. Um, So Estelle, I'm going to come to you first. What's your big takeaway from this first match? It's that we start really badly, isn't it? Every kind of crunch situation or crunch tournament we go into, it seems like Sri Lanka starts really badly. And that was the one thing, the big thing we were talking about in our preview video as well. That if they can get a good start in this first test, if they can either win or if they can give a good game to South Africa, that will give them confidence to go into the second game as well. And that didn't happen. The bowlers, I thought, were really good. Um, I mean, you know, that 190 could have been 150, but you're not... The reason Sri Lanka lost is the 42, right? You're not... You, you can't point fingers at anything else. Uh, disappointing betting performance, I think, particularly by some of the senior batters, some of those shots that were played. South Africa were good with the ball and conditions were conducive to their type of bowling. But some of those shots, I don't know um, how you can kind of justify the way they went about things in that first innings. Nick, do you agree? Yeah, I totally do. I mean, I know some people have criticised the bowlers for being flat on day three at the start of that second innings. But just imagine how disheartening it is when you've bowled a team out for 190 and then your batters last 13 and a bit overs and you're back in the field in an hour and a half. And I think that in this situation, you have to give the bowlers a complete sort of pass and to say that the batting wasn't good enough. I think time and again over the past six months, over the past year, Sri Lanka have shown that when the going is tough and conditions are difficult to bat against the new ball, there's no dig in, there's no fight. They just get blown over. Um, And I was looking back, I don't think there's been a first wicket 50 run partnership since the tour of Bangladesh way back in March. Uh, And yeah, look, as Estelle said, the game was lost in that first innings, 42 all out. But for me, 100 for five, second time around in the fourth innings. Again, when you're trying to save a bit of face and trying to put some gloss on what has been a horrid performance, it's not good enough. There were too many loose shots, not enough desire to occupy the crease to just get through the periods where the ball's moving about and try and keep yourself there for when it gets a bit easier to bat. So, yeah, I think we've got to be really critical of the application the batters showed, especially the senior batters. The one guy who I give a bit of license to is Kamindu because he scored so many runs by taking on balls (laughs) outside that off stump that you don't necessarily want him to shelve shots. Uh, Strange and disappointing to see him get twin failures for the first time in Test cricket. But yeah, I think the application wasn't there and... Again, I go back to like the preparation. I, we can talk about this till we're blue in the face. But have SLC given these the, these guys the best opportunity to perform and succeed in a really difficult test? 
And I just think they haven't done and why half this team was playing in a meaningless bilateral rule ODI series. Just it's again, it's baffling. It's disappointing. It reminded me a lot of that Old Trafford test in England where like the team looks green and underprepared and just mm. kind of rolls over. Yeah, I, just a couple of things I want to pick up on. Um, DDS in his post-match interview said, um, you know, we just didn't have time to adjust to Marco Janssen. If he's not one of the three player, three bowlers you're sort of immediately preparing for, obviously Rabada, you might prepare for Maharaj, but you know Janssen is going to take the new ball, right? And he's tall, he gets good bounce, you know, he can shape him back into the right-handers, right? What are you doing, right? And also playing shots out uh, outside of your off stump, right? Come in, do we give a pass? Part of the re- the role he plays in that team is to provide the impetus to get the game moving along around the senior batters, right? But when the lengths are such that if you leave the ball, it's not going to hit the stumps, like unless you get a great delivery. Chundi got a great delivery in that first innings. Not much you can do for that you got to be using the leave as one of your primary shots. And we saw that Temba did it. We saw the South African batters do it. And and to pick up on Estelle's point of we're just not good enough in the first inning. So in away matches against Australia, England, India, New Zealand, and South Africa. So basically big time away matches. In the last five years, we have exactly zero first innings hundreds from our batters. Um, Angelo Matthews has an average of 17 with zero 50s or 100s, obviously. Um, DeMuth is averaging 21, um, and Chundi is averaging 28. And that's just not good enough from your 30-plus-year-old batters who you're expecting to hold the innings together in those really tough conditions to carry you through. And I think um, that's, that's sort of what was missing. You needed the senior batters, right, to just dig in and scrape you to 150 so that that second dig matters. Uh, but they couldn't. And and what's fascinating is that, so while they all average very low in that first innings, they all have averages above 40 in the second innings, right? And there's better application. Sometimes the match is out of hand, so there's less pressure on. Um, but I think it really shows that This is an issue that the team needs to address. And it's something that I think we can rightly criticize um, the seniors for because they should set the tone. They should set the tempo. We don't want Potham and Kusal and Kamindu restraining themselves because um, they're afraid that they'll last, not not last 13 overs, right? That's that's just absolutely absurd. Um, I want to go back to the preparation question, Estelle. What do you think the, the players who did go over were, again, some of the players who failed to show any sort of adequate technique against the moving ball in South Africa, against the extra bounce? Do you think that's just, do, do you think it's that the two weeks that they spent there isn't enough to adjust? Or do you think their preparations were just incorrect and they weren't focusing on the right kind of things? I think. First of all, like you have to say that South Africa is one of the toughest places to bat, particularly for Asian batters, right? Because it's conditions that are completely alien to them. And I mean, if you look at the South African batters themselves, they also struggle in their own conditions. What I think that should have been a non-negotiable going into this series was a practice game. I don't Mm -hmm. think it would have made a difference going going there one month early. But I think if you had got the opportunity to play a practice game, then that would have given them a better feel of what's going on with these tracks. Of course, I don't think Cricket South Africa would have been generous enough to offer a similar type of uh, pitch to what they played on. But I think it would have given them that feel of the conditions, right? I mean, that's, that's kind of like there's only so much you can do to prepare for a series like this within a short period of time. And you know, the schedule is so stacked that you don't really, you can't afford to have multiple games. I remember probably when we were younger, like you go to South Africa, you, sorry, you go to Australia, you play like two games against states before you actually get to the proper international games, right? 
nowadays the schedule doesn't allow that but i think one practice game would have made a difference in that it would have given them a better feel of how things were because if you look at the bowlers they adjusted right they, yep. they they seemed like they had their plans and how they needed to go about things and they bowled really well and with great discipline um, particularly with the no, new ball so um this as you pointed out like the issues it's you can't really when you look at those numbers in the first innings you can't really say it's it's solely conditions related right yeah. it, it is something else as well because if you're not making runs in the first innings you're basically not making important enough runs right yeah um nick i want to kind of ask you to drill down on on this first innings woes right what do you think it is right i think estelle's right that it shows a lack of preparation um i don't know the 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 extent to which we might even say the white ball pitches have an impact right you're playing on pitches that don't get bounced that don't get any lateral movement um yes different formats but does it you know you're facing 45 overs a spin does that set you up to face Rabada and Janssen with the new ball? Like, absolutely not at all, right? And it showed that a number of them were discomforted by that extra bounce. They're not used to the ball seeming around. They're not used to having five guys standing behind the bat yep. in the slip cordon. But I think, I mean, it's... I think it's also the way you handle pressure, the way that you deal with being thrown into big situations. And too often, the instinct seems to be like oh I'll just have a fish at that ball that's way outside of off stump and I mean you look at that first innings the 42 all out no one in the bat seven lasts more than 20 balls mm. and you know your tail is Prabath, uh, Asitha, Vishwa and Lehru like probably the longest tail in world cricket mm. and yep. none of you are able to stick around for more than 20 balls it's just not good enough and you're always going to lose test matches if you bat like that uh yeah it's it's really disappointing but the, like your point dom that a lot of these guys a lot of the senior guys have better averages in the second innings it seems totally counterintuitive and i think it shows that this isn't necessarily a technical issue or an ability issue but it's more to do with temperament approach and mindset yeah and i think this Starting badly has been an issue even in limited overs cricket, right? Like if you look at tournaments, major tournaments, the T20 World Cup, the ODI World Cup, it's like you play terribly in your first game and then that sets the tone for your campaign, right? And unfortunately for Sri Lanka, like this is when they needed to really stand up and like make a mark because like we discussed before, this is the this is the first time in the World Test Championship that they have a pro they actually have a proper proper chance of making it to the final. Previously, it was always an outside chance because you know India and Australia had dominated, or you know New Zealand was right on top. This time they let, like if they had played to their strengths, and we discussed this again. This isn't the South Africa we played in 2019. They do have their weaknesses. They have a good bowling attack, yeah. but in the back on the batting side they do have their weaknesses and it it was exploited by the bowlers so that starting well and getting your kind of head in the right space i think is something that really needs to be addressed now yeah also, i think yeah go no, ahead, i was just going to say i'm sorry also like i think it's a point worth making that they didn't have to be good to stay in that game after the first no. move, right they just had to not be totally catastrophic if someone can hang around for 40 50 balls and get 30 like you know yeah. all of a sudden you're up towards 100 and the deficit isn't massive so it's not like we're asking them to go out and make 450 on a really tough pitch like if you can show a bit of grit and a bit of fight and get yourself to 120 130 you're right in the game but the nature of that blowout just meant that any yeah. momentum Sri Lanka had was completely stopped dead in the tracks. And it was just yeah. so hard, I think, for the team to recover yeah. from that. And you had to last 15, 20 overs on that pitch, right? That was, it, it yeah. was not, it was not the spiciest pitch you've ever seen, right? It, it was, it, it moved, it bounced, but that's what you expect in South Africa. Um, but if they had just lasted 
you know, batted the first two sessions, or sorry, the last two sessions of day two, things had eased out a lot on day three, and they would have had a lot of good time to to bat and make some runs um, on day three if they were just able to last it out. And I think that patience is something that, um, that first innings patience is something that they have to try to cultivate. Um, and I think it's something that we are, we want to rely on the seniors for, but they're not bringing it right. They're not, they're not providing it. Like if you're playing with seven attacking players, you can kind of say, okay, like they were all aggressive. They all got out playing their shots and we got shot out, but that's not, that's not the character or style of our team. Yeah. And that's the most disappointing thing, right? Like if there'd been 50 all out in 20 overs, you can yeah. almost kind of not that not that it's a good thing, but it it at least shows that you've tried to survive. Right. Like thirteen point five overs, Jansen, you didn't even like you didn't give him time to get tired. They bowled him yeah, the six point five right. overs at a stretch, and he was done. Right, the innings was done. Yeah. So like there wasn't, it, or at least it, to be honest, even the bowlers, it seems like there's never any attempt to stick around right yeah. some of those shots like you you can't play international cricket and say my job is to just bowl yeah you at least that effort should be there right to stick around like i know yeah. if i know even if there's a, another tail ender on the other end whatever runs particularly in, in 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 matches like this where you know it's a low scoring game and i thought i thought maharaja's little cameo made a big yeah. difference there because he came out there he attacked and he was able to get some runs it kind of took a bit of pressure off um temba on the other end mm -hmm. so like when when our guys come and just throw their wickets around even a 20 runs there could make a difference right yeah and even just just day 4 uh, once you know number 9 came out Kusal Mendes started stopped taking singles. Mm -hmm. He was just, you know, and, and if you can't trust your um, your number nine batter to just yeah. bat out three or four balls, then you're in a very, very tough situation, especially where there's no time limit, right? Like it's not as if, okay, you know, you have to chase 30 from 15 or something like that and only you can do it. But not even being able to, to face um, the South African bowlers is a, is a real problem. Um, okay, let's, let's switch tack a little bit and talk about this second match, right? So we played at Durban previously, we had not lost a test match at Durban. Now that record is sullied, but we go to Port Elizabeth where we have also had some historic success. Um, uh, Nick, what can Sri Lanka do to turn this around? Do you think this is something that do you think they can pull it together and potentially win this test match and keep their world tra test championship hopes alive? I think it's going to be really hard with the momentum that they've lost through that first match. But we've seen over the course of Sri Lankan cricket history, right? Triumph and tragedy always seem to have a way <laughs> of going hand in hand. And I mean, when they won here 2-0 in 2019, you know, they were in, in the depths of a really bad period. So you can't rule it out, right? Um, I guess some small positives for Sri Lanka to cling on to is that Gerald Kurtzier has been declared out of this second test. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what the status is with Weir Mulder's injury. Is he going to play? Also He's, He's also, also out. out. So South Africa have called up uh, the young Mafaka. I guess it'll be yeah. him or Dane Patterson taking... Oh, from Kurtzia, I can't see them playing two spinners unless it's a real dust bowl in PE. Uh, but South Africa are going to be slightly, uh, well, changed and shorthanded maybe yeah. a little bit. And look, I think we saw in the first innings 190 that this top order is a little bit callow uh, of the more experienced players. You've got Mark Crum, who is out of touch. That was Bavuma's, what, third century in his long yeah. test career. Yeah. So they're not exactly like Elgar or Callis or uh, mm. De Villiers, these guys. Yeah. And uh, I think, yeah, that Sri Lanka just have to bat better in the first innings. And I mean, I wonder if we'll see a change. Going back to that last point, we were talking about the tail. Like, I don't see it being sustainable, having Prabath batting at eight in test cricket. He's got an average of seven. And it's not that he lacks ability. <laughs> yeah, but he yeah. can 
play innings, but he just has zero temperament for batting. He tries to play a shot to yeah. every ball. And so I wonder if we'll see Milan Ratnayaka. Like, I know you can't or shouldn't be picking bowlers because they can bat, <laughs> but I feel that, like, that 8 to 11 is kind of hamstringing Sri Lanka. But I think that, yeah, things just need to go better from the top down. And I yeah. strike on the fact that we haven't seen a 50 partnership in a long time. Uh, I think that's a really big problem. I know we were talking off air about Patham's approach and we don't want to see him going back to the kind of more dogged Nisanka 1.0 before he grew into a great white ball player. But I do think that he's playing too many shots at the moment for an opening batter. And, I mean, you look at what he's done since coming back into the side. He had a great test at the Oval where he scored 100 and unbeaten 160. But aside from that, he hasn't passed 30 in any of the other three tests. And, I, I mean, I just wonder long term, I don't think they're going to make this change now, but whether he's more suited to batting at three or whether he just has to kind of gear his innings and look towards a bit more trajectory in the... I need to survive the first 30 balls and then I can start playing my shots rather than looking to play cuts and drives and pulls from ball one because, I mean, it's great to watch when it comes off yeah. and I really enjoyed that second innings cameo. But I think you have to say it's looking like if he takes that approach, he's going to fail more than he succeeds and we'll yeah. get an occasional 100 that's glorious amidst a run of low scores. I don't think Sri Lanka have that luxury to be able to afford that kind of player at the top at the moment, especially with Dimuth looking like he's uh, going through a run of really lean form. Estelle, what do you think about the, the Potham, Potham's approach here? Yeah, it's an interesting one. Like Nick said, right? You You don't want him to go back to being kind of that slow starter it's good to have that kind of batter who who does play a few shots and can get you off to a good start but I think there's a point to be made about the num like the amount of shots he's playing and I think it's particularly relevant when you are playing overseas right and in mm -hmm. conditions like these where the ball is seeming around so like the likelihood of you nicking behind is very very high right so I suppose he can afford to do that, play that way in countries like Sri Lanka, where you don't get that much lateral movement early, or or that movement doesn't last very long. But in countries like South Africa, look, I know there's a lot of T20 cricket being played right now, and that's that's obviously the focus for a lot of countries. But there are there are players who are successful in multiple formats, right? And they learn to adjust. And what we've seen from Patum is that he is a smart cricketer. He started off limited overs cricket in a certain vein, but has learned and grown over the last few years. Yeah. So I would expect that he is able to adapt. I mean, you only have to look to the South African side, right? Stubbs, the way he played. Um, uh, my understanding is that he's all he's he's been a very good first class cricketer for South Africa, although we know him as like this T Twenty player because he he obviously kind of burst onto the scene with with that IPL contract, didn't he? So we know him as that limited overs cricketer who can bash it about, but he has a good first class record, and that innings he played in that second the second innings of that game, sure there wasn't much pressure on him, but. He played his shots. At the same time, he was able to kind of judge where he needs to go hard and where he needs to kind of leave the ball and, you know, take it slow, right? Mm. So I, I I would, I mean, I'm optimistic that someone like Patum in particular can make that adjustment and adapt his game according to the format he's playing because he has shown that he's capable, he is someone who thinks about how the modern game is being played and kind of makes those adjustments. Yeah, I, I think um, those are two really good points. I think cuts and drives are probably things you need to shelve for the first 20 overs of a test match in South Africa, right? Uh, maybe in Sri Lanka, you can play those a little bit more regularly, but that's something, again, he's going to have to kind of contend with. And it doesn't mean that he can't do it. Obviously, as Estelle has shown, he did the harder thing to go from being a stodgy opener to being a more expansive opener. Um, and I think he 
we'll see how he improves and how he adapts. Um, I do want to give a shout out to Dinesh Chandamal. You know, obviously mm-hmm. there was a first innings failure, but I thought he was one of the guys who really got out to a good ball. The ball that got him out was an absolute corker. And then he dug in in that second innings and showed application and he um, stayed there and he waited till he had gotten past 50 to sort of unleash the traditional Chandamal shots that we see, the cut, the the cover drive, um, and I thought he batted pretty well. And I also, think, just to cut yeah. in, like, remember he's kind of batting out of position to yeah. accommodate someone else's preference, right? Like, because Sri Lanka needed to kind of find a way to give Kusal Mendes a spot in the side because of, I mean, obviously he's a valuable batter. He's the one who was kind of making the sacrifice yeah. and batting at number three where he doesn't usually bat. Yeah, and I thought he did a great job, and I think he's going to be key as kind of and and um, as sort of like thinking about the last two years, he's one of those players who's really kind of stood up um, in terms of taking that responsibility. I think um, we need a special innings probably from one of Nisanka or Kamindu to kind of give us a chance. We need a big hundred from one of them. Um, And we need the other batters to kind of bat around them and and give them the support and allow them to stay out there. And I think to Nick's point, um, if Kutsia is out, right, um, it kind of means you have to survive that first Rabada Janssen spell, right? And then you get some chances to kind of it's a little bit softer and right without Mulder there as well, you're losing a a crucial all rounder who can, who can bowl um, some good quality tidy overs. So if you can make it through that first new ball spell, there should be opportunities for this Sri Lankan lineup to get runs. Um, So I think the openers are going to be really important. Um, And I think there's, there's a learning process. There's a learning curve for, you know, Potham or for Potham and Kamindu, right? How does Kamindu respond to his first set of low scores, right? Does he keep on playing the way he's playing? Because I think part of the magic of watching Kamindu bat is, as he said, he keeps it simple. He doesn't try to overcomplicate things. He has a method, he trusts it, and he keeps on at it. And we know how he's kind of going to get out, right? Because he's kind of set up a pattern, but that's also how he scores runs. So, um, It'll be interesting to see how he adjusts because I think, again, this is probably, these are probably the liveliest decks, the bounciest decks he's played on um, in his career. Um, Estelle, I want to ask you about Nick's point about Milan Rutnaika. Do you think mm-hmm. Rutnaika gets a go in this game or do you think um, they stay effectively with the same 11? Yeah, that's, that's, it's very interesting because of what happened in that England series, isn't it? Like, we would yeah. never be talking about four fast bowlers uh, if that didn't happen because that was like a yeah. su- surprise decision and it, it, it brought success, right? Sri Lanka ended up winning that game on the back of some really good bowling from those four. So I wouldn't yeah. be surprised, to be honest, if, the, if they did bring Milan Ratnak in, although I do think that Kasun Rajita would be a better option in these mm-hmm. conditions. Um, the temptation, of, of course, would be to go for Milan because of his superior batting ability. I think also Nishan Piris is another one who kind of can bat. But I don't see them share, like like benching uh, Prabhat for him. So I think it'll be very dependent on what the conditions look like. I don't think they will be afraid to pick four fast bowlers. But if it's going to be, and I mean, generally Port Elizabeth is can get spin friendly later yeah. on in the test, right? So um, it, it's difficult to say if they they'd want to go in without that spinner. Um, but I I just think they need to, you know tell those bowlers that they need to step it up with the bat, right? It's yeah. it's about playing the situation as well. Getting, you know, 10 runs in two balls is important in some games. And in some games, it's important to just survive those 10 balls, right? So yeah. um, that, that, that just has to be something that they drill into them because you can't have this happening where basically your 8, 9, 10, 11 are walking wickets, no? Yeah. Yeah. And and this leads me kind of to my next question. Uh, Nick, 
fast bowling all rounders. Is there are there do you do you have any thoughts about how Sri Lanka might find somebody outside of those last four who could bat and bowl a bit? Obviously, Angelo in his prime was someone we turned to to do that. We tried Das and Chanaka that didn't really work. Um, Chamaka, I think, played a test in Australia, but we haven't really given a go to a true fast bowling all rounder for for some time. No, and uh, they all seem to have more impact in white ball cricket, don't they? Even mm-hmm. going back to someone like Tisara Pereira, who made a really yeah. promising start to his test career and then quite quickly became a white ball only player. I mean, look, being a fast bowling all rounder in test cricket, it's not easy to do, right? Yeah. It's a real workload. But I think Sri Lanka probably have to try and harness what they've got. And when they can find someone who shows potential, even if it's someone like Wiki who looks more of a white ball prospect than a red ball prospect, do you try and shoehorn them in and give them opportunities to maximise that potential? Uh, I, yeah, it's interesting. I can't see Milan coming in only because... Unless it's a real pitch, which looks to favour fast bowling as opposed to spin. Yeah. Because I thought the three seamers actually did well, right? Lahiru Kamara looked like such a handful. And I thought Vishwa, again, was um, mm. just looked a far superior bowler to the one we saw during the yeah. England series. Much, and much first, better, right? Much, much better. Really dangerous. Uh, yeah. So I wonder, I think Sri Lanka probably will go in unchanged. I think that's the right thing to do. But just um, going back to your point, Dom, about the lack of a fast bowling all-rounder and a new third seamer, it makes it really important you, that you get through that early period. But also, I think if Sri Lanka can attack Maharaj, uh, especially the left-handers, who are you know he's going to be turning the ball into, then you start to get into that situation where you're asking your three main seamers to come back and bowl three, four spells mm-hmm. and putting miles in their legs. And that's when you can like, really take advantage and dominate, right? And so I think the messaging is I'm not like telling anyone to change their approach and that I want to see someone score 20 off 200 balls. But just if you can get through those periods where ball is on top of bat mm-hmm. and then cash in when the equation's more in your favour. I feel like that kind of more nuanced approach would really, really benefit the team. Yeah. I think also, you know, kind of thinking about um, playing the situation, right? Even the end of day three, where they gave up three wickets, basically. Like any chance they had to kind of put on a threatening total, not that they were going to chase, you know, 500 runs or whatever, but you know, they're 84 for two or whatever. And then they end up 109 for five, right? Those kind of things can't happen. Um, You got to be very careful. You got to know how to deal with those situations. And I think uh, that's something we should expect from this side. This is not a young side that doesn't know how to do that. We, that this is a side that has the experience to know how to do that. So I think, um, it should be interesting. I think South Africa's injury woes will make this a bit closer. So we'll we'll see what happens. We'll be back daily to kind of give you the report on what's going on. I want to end by asking a little bit about the future. So if Sri Lanka lose this match, okay, um, effectively ending their chance at winning a World Test Championship, do you think it's the end of the road for any of the seniors in this side? So, uh, Nick, I'll go to you first. Uh, I think it should be. Uh, and I think that, look, I mean, of those three guys who've been so crucial, such a sort of backbone for Sri Lanka for a long time, I think Chandamal is the one who still looks like he's got the most gas left in the tank. To me, Dimuth and Angelo, their returns have been diminishing, right? And Angelo, we saw during the England series, was a bit of a liability in the field. Uh, Wasn't bowling overs. It was nice to see him bowling in that first test. But he (laughs) hasn't scored a real big body of runs uh, for over the past year now, right? Since those tests against Afghanistan Mm -hmm. and Bangladesh. Uh, Dimuth looks to me to be short on form, 
uh, we were talking about it off air that outside of those Ireland tests, I think he last scored 100 in 2022, mid-2022 against India. And I think more to the point is that if you look at what's been going on with the A-team, we've been seeing these guys like, um, you know, Ahan, Wikramasinghe, um, yes. Pasindu Surya Bandara, Pavan, mm. all yes. doing really well. Uh, you've got, my brain's going all Monday. Vish was little brother. No, I do like mm, knocking yeah. on the door. And you, I don't think you want a situation where these guys are growing old, missing chances to play in their mid to early twenties yeah. so that Angelo, Dimuth and Chandy can keep staying in this side till they're 40. Uh, I would have thought that the start of a new world test championship cycle is the start of a time to, to, yeah. We to start start a rebuild, right? And I think, yeah, you've got to give some of these younger guys a chance to see whether they'll sink or swim sooner rather than later. Uh, because we kind of saw with Kamindu, right? I mean, you could say that he came to the party at the right time, but another line of thinking could be that you had a potentially world-class player hanging around the fringes of the side for too long. Estelle, your thoughts? Yeah, I, I mean, I agree with Nick for the large part. I think... Actually, I think Dimuth was close to retiring even before this cycle, right? Like he was talking about giving yeah. up his captaincy and moving on from that point, but he's stuck around. And the thing is like, you know, we've spoken so much about experience and stuff, particularly with the limited oversights over the last few years. Um, I don't really have a problem with the ages. Like, I mean, they could play to 45 if they're scoring runs. But if you look at Dimuth and Angelo in particular, they're not making those big hundreds they used to, right? Like you're used to seeing, and this is why Dimut has such a great reputation, you know, not just in Sri Lanka, but overseas as well as one of the better openers of his generation is that he was getting big runs. Like he would get, he wouldn't get you a 50 and get out. He would convert, right? Yeah. Similarly, Angelo, you, 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 this is the guy who's kind of, you know, battered a whole day in, New Zealand um, in difficult conditions to save a test, you know, played knocks like that. But you're not seeing those hundreds from these guys. And I think that is a massive problem for Sri Lanka because you have to get runs to win the game. Sure, the wickets, 20 wickets to win a test match is is, is what you have to yeah. do. But if you're not making runs, that is a real problem. And I think Kamindu's form has actually bailed Sri Lanka out over the, you know, the last year or so in that yeah. he's been so prolific but even DDS has not been getting hundreds has he he's, he's been getting those 50s and I think even in this game in my opinion Chandimal and DDS should be disappointed they didn't get hundreds they, they should have yeah should have had innings like Stubbs and Bavuma, right? Because sure, Sri Lanka was not going to chase 500, but the conditions had eased up enough that there were more runs in that pitch and, and you know, runs for the taking for both of them. And it's a similar situation to what we saw in England as well, where, you know, there were 50s from those senior players, but none of them got hundreds. The hundreds came from Patum and Kamindu, right? So... Yeah. I would, I, I mean, I completely agree with Nick on, on Angelo and Dimuth. I don't mind them staying on, but they need to be making runs. And they, it's not it's not about the average. Like if you look at averages, Angelo is averaging 40 this year, I think. And people are going to look at that and say, look, he's, yeah. he's doing enough. But I don't think that is enough in test cricket, right? And not um, from your number four. Yeah. And 141 of those runs came in a test match against... Afghanistan, right? Mm -hmm. So his only hundred is that is in from January of this year or February of this year, or a hundred against Afghanistan, and and so then since then he's averaging uh, around thirty basically, mm -hmm. and and I think um, one thing I'll add is Demuth has now played ninety seven Test matches, so I have an inkling that he'll play this match and he'll play the two against Australia, and maybe his hundredth Test match will also be his retirement. Uh, farewell, unless they're going to, you know, the World Test Championship that summer. But that could be a good, you know, a good way to wrap it up for him. I know he's said he wanted to play 100 test matches. That, to me, seems certainly fair for who, for a player I consider to be Sri Lanka's greatest, you know, maybe one or two best, op one, uh, two best openers, depending on how we rate these things. And mm -hmm. uh, 
when the day comes, we will have that discussion about where we rank all these players in the pantheon of Sri Lankan greats. So don't worry about that. He's averaging 40.13 right now. I'm sure he's desperate for however long he plays to keep that average above 40, Mm -hmm. uh, knowing the type of player he is. So I I would imagine that DeMuth is probably going to call it a career um, after this cycle, um, whether that's against Australia or during the final. Um, I agree that Chundi is probably the guy who's playing best at the moment. And, uh, you know, if Angelo retires, I think he'd feel very comfortable moving down to four. Yeah. And, and I don't think it. you want all three of them to go at once either, right? Yeah. You yeah. probably want at least one of them to stick around for a few more series. Yeah. And I think, I think Demuth is, or sorry, uh, uh, Chundi is that guy. Um, and I think Angelo, he's been playing since 2008. Uh, he's had a great career. I, I'm trying to see if there are any, you know, sort of statistical milestones. He's almost at 8,000 runs. He's, He's 7,966. So I would say the end of this cycle is probably, you know, oh, the time, the right time for him to call it a day. But who knows? We've, we've called uh, curtains on different aspects of Angelo's career many times, and it's not been true. So oh, um, we'll all be waiting to see. I'm sure if Mark was here, he would say, no, Angelo is going to play for another 10 years and, uh, and prove us all wrong. Mm-hmm. Um, so shall we wrap it there, guys? Or does anyone have anything else to add? All right. Well, we've been the Morally End. Um, if you've made it all this way, please subscribe, comment, like. Um, and we will be back with you in three days to cover these the second test in South Africa live. Thank you.